My name is Kiskeya Addison. I am Director of Consulting at Just Tech, and we are here to talk about RFPs and vendor selection. And we have our esteemed panelists, Susan Cho and Simon Ra, who will discuss with us their own process, the trials and tribulations of creating RFPs and also selecting the right vendor. As we were talking about earlier, selecting the right vendor can almost seem like a marriage. It's a relationship, it's trying to figure things out together and work together. So I think we should just get started because we have a full party here. Okay, so I put this one on. We're really excited, right? We just found out we got funding. We have the money to do that project. We did some type of needs assessment potentially, and we know that this is what our community is asking for, and we want to get it done. And so we're in that super excited, we're ready, we're going to get this done, and we're just like, let's do this. And then we're just confused, right? Because we're trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this? The work that needs to be done can't be completed internally. And I, you know, maybe I knew that, right? So I already thought I will have to look for a contractor or I may have to look for a vendor, but maybe I haven't actually created the documentation to help me do that work. So we're here today to start helping you just think about, okay, what are the things to think about as you are developing your first RFP or your second or your third? And then how, what is the selection process that you can use that is, we would say equitable, right? That's fair and that we can ensure that we have also a trail that we can show people, this is how we made this determination as this is the vendor we work with. These are the requirements that we set forth and it just helps with our relationship and future. So today we're just gonna talk about, so RFPs, vendor selection. So how do you develop an RFP? I remember the first time I had to develop an RFP and honestly what I did was I scoured LSNTAP and I looked for other sample RFPs. And then I talked to people in my, my office and I asked them for some samples. So I just looked for everything I possibly could to see what was out there. And they were all different. Some of them were one page, some of them were 10 pages. And so I tried to figure out what was that happy medium where I'd be able to determine what do I need to communicate and what do I need from a vendor. And so what do, we're gonna talk about what to include in the RFP, how to create the criteria, to select and part of that criteria is, is sort of we, so we can ensure equity and fairness, right? And then what are just some DIB and JEDI considerations? So diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, or justice, equity, and diversity and, and inclusion considerations. So we're gonna pass it over to Susan who will present. Okay, so, um, you know, so we were talking prior to, and um, we we're talking about um, whether Simon and I are RFP gurus. I will tell you, I am not. Um, I think I struggle with this as much as anyone. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna talk about a process where we did our own kind of version of an RFP process because it was it, the, the task of what we were trying to accomplish was so daunting in a way that we had to um, re kind of think that RFP process. Um, um, for uh, a project. So, but I'm gonna talk about, you know, here are some key components for an RFP. I'm sure everyone has worked on an RFP. Everyone has seen this. Everyone has said, this is the general rubric, right? So project overview, you know, basically you wanna give one or three sentences about what the project is. Um, and then like a description of like your organization or company, you know, you know, like, you know, like a lot of companies will say, this is where we are in our market positions. This is what we do. But, you know, I'm going to assume that for the most part, you folks are nonprofits. So talk about, you know, who you are, what you do, what's important to you, and also who's your target audience, you know, low income clients, maybe um, in terms of, or maybe you're part of a particular um, niche within a nonprofit, but make sure that because this really is a marriage or like dating. We talked about that as well. Um, and so they have to know kind of where you're coming from in order to get a sense of whether this is a relationship that they want to try to engage in. So, and then I wanna talk a little bit, then I'll talk a little bit more about some of these things and then I'm gonna break out scope of work. And then in terms of, I'm gonna talk about it within a case study of the Ohio Legal Help, um, I'm gonna say, Redesign is not a strong enough word. I would say complete build um, in terms of how we approach that. Timelines are important because this really is for the vendor. They need to understand 
both the scope of the work, what it entails, what your functional requirements, technical requirements, you know, what infrastructure are they working with? What's your goals? Um, but at the same time, they need to make sure that your timeline is going to work in with their current like staffing structure, you know, the um, software developers or who they have available. And so that's really critical. Now, in terms of the budget, I put optional here. Um, I, you know, I'm sure every time I've done an RFP, the, um, the vendor would have loved to have known what's my kind of top line budget. So, but, you know, sometimes I don't want to know that. I, I really literally just want to know what they're proposing um, to meet the requirements that I've set forth and what they're going to cost it out at. Because they'll give me an opportunity then to look at different proposals. It'll give me an opportunity then to think through each of the cost lines. And sometimes it's not the cheapest proposal in a sense, the lowest proposal that you'll want to go with because you'll want to think through that relationship. You'll want to think through all the plus factors that you want to think through when you finally select the vendor for your project. And then Simon's going to touch a lot more on this, which is the selection criteria and submission instructions. But what I thought I would do for each of these components is to kind of go through um, an SOW that we recently did in terms of like what some of this might sound like, if you will. And I'm also glad to share um, one of our SOWs so that folks um, have a sense of the detail sometimes that you need um, to get a good bid. Because unless you, unless you really lay out what your minimum kind of functional requirements are, um, it's gonna be really hard for the vendor to make an appropriate bid. So for instance, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so Ohio Legal Help is on um, Drupal 9. Um, we use a module called Web Forms within the Drupal infrastructure. Um, to build out our document assembly. It's integrated with a bunch of third-party products, which was, is, is important to know, but we would, we would have talked about that in the RFP in terms of the infrastructure in which we're asking for developers to build, okay? Um, but in terms of the project overview, basically what we were getting, you know, a scope of work for or a project bid for was we wanted to be able to enhance our current web forms infrastructure so that we could scale up forms quickly. So that's our goal, right? And then in terms of our project overview, what we wanted to do was to have the ability to use our web forms infrastructure to create individual data sets that could then be collated into our document assembly. And those data sets needed to be reusable as well. And so that was our project overview. Um, description of who we are, we, we always talk about, you know, how legal help, our history, you know, recommendation, you know, our, our placement within kind of the um, continuum of services, and then, you know, like our role within the court system and so forth, right? And then our project goals, well, this is important because while we're going to talk a lot about kind of the technical aspects of what that build would entail, our project goal here at the end of the day is to make it easier for my staff to scale up forms for multiple jurisdictions, right? So by having data sets of information that are reusable across multiple collated data sets and forms, um, you know, it makes it easier for my staff then to create something for Montgomery County, something for Cuyahoga County, something for Hamilton County. And we're not a um, unified court, and so even though there are uniform forms, each court likes to add, let's just say its own special little nuance to that form. And so that's the reason why we're doing this. And so our goal here is really about scalability, about forms, about standing up product faster for um, both the constituents and our customers, which are our users, but then also to accommodate some special requests from courts. And so we want to make sure that folks understood that. Now, in terms of the scope of work and those deliverables, that's where it gets tricky. So go to the next slide. So, you know, functional requirements, how to develop requirements. 
this is tricky. So I will tell you, because of everything we kind of learned through our build, we were able to um, create kind of the critical functionality and lay that out um, you know, much easier. So you know, we had in terms of our overarching kind of like high level, if you will, functional requirements was we, we said essentially an administrator has to be able to use the same data set within our infrastructure for any form. And we kind of went through kind of each of the things we made sure to explain that, um, you know, what we wanted the user experience functional requirements to be. And so we kind of laid it out within kind of a user experience functional requirements. We laid it out within kind of some of the back end requirements. And then we also laid out things within the infrastructure within which the um, vendor would ultimately be working. So obviously, we're Drupal 9, we talked about that, WebForms modules and things like that. But then we also um, laid out our preferred project management. We're a Jira shop, so we wanted to make sure that folks understood that, you know, because that's our workflow. Um, and so we wanted to make sure there was a good match on that. So we go to that level of detail in terms of the project management. And then in terms of the testing and QA, how that will go. And then we always ask and make sure that folks understand that we want documentation. I think that that's something that um, folks sometimes miss in an RFP. We always make sure that folks understand that we will want the documentation. So while we have our own JIRA, um, it's not always the um, what folks use. And so what we'll make sure is that, you know, we make sure that they're a JIRA shop. And then you can actually ask for the Jira export afterwards because what we don't want to do is to, um, we want to make sure that we work within a vendor's workflow as well. We don't want added costs just to adjust to us, if that makes sense. So then, you know, one of the things that folks asked was, so what if you just don't know where to begin, right? We know our product at this point to a point where it's much easier for us to um, build out an RFP. Um, we could probably do an RFQ and you'll hear different terms, right? So an RFI is where, um, and I think Simon will touch on this as well. So some folks will do an RFI, which is more of a request for information. It's where you're, it's a little bit more loosey goosey. So it's kind of in between, right? So an RFP is in between is requests for proposals. And then when I was with the state of Ohio, Sometimes we would do an RFQ, which is we knew exactly what we wanted built. We knew exactly the way we wanted it built. And we, we literally asked for a quote um, for a vendor to build exactly in that way, right? So that's an RFQ. So there's multiple kind of in between. Now for an RFP, you know, the functional requirements is often the, I think, especially when you, you let's say you had an idea. I'm going to build an app. I want um, to build an app for, you know, low-income client to be able to, let's say, um, maybe put together an eviction defense with an answer. Let's say that, right? Um, but you're not exactly sure where to start. But you had this idea. This is what you got funded. Um, you knew that you knew what the need was. You knew all this, and then, and you have this amount of dollars to spend, right? And so you need to put together the functional requirements. So what we did with Ohio Legal Help, because it was a complete build of a website um, and we weren't sure what the stakeholders would need. We weren't sure what the, our clients would ultimately need. We actually hired consultants to help us put together a statewide portal, if you will, with, with the components um, and folks have heard this from the PU, right? About asking, refining, right? Um, and then, so we, we, we put together a group of consultants to help us work with one. We identified the stakeholders that would be involved. We then did landscaping to identify the needs, right? Of, the, of our primary target user, low-income Ohioans, right? Um, and then we identified based upon that landscaping, what the gaps were and what the needs were. Um, and what we learned when we did both the voice of stakeholder and voice of, of the customer was that there was really great alignment. Folks requested forms 
So simple, easy document assembly. And folks requested information about how to connect to lawyers and other local resources to help them, right? Um, and then also folks said family law was their number one request, right? And so, and then when we further identified gaps, folks said it would be nice if instead of me kind of hunting and pecking through the site, if you guys helped me and guide me. So some guided interviews, if you will. Um, and then we identified that at a high level, and then we did some refinement of those requirements. And then this is what we did. We didn't issue an RFP. So I'm gonna make a confession here. We didn't issue an RFP because we, to be fair, I'm sure we've all done RFPs where we think it's, you know, we, we've, we've identified, we've, you know, we've gone through all the rubric, you know, we've set forth, we've, we put together the selection criteria, you know, we sent it out to everyone we know, we sent it out to every listserv, we, and then you get one proposal, right? Or maybe you don't get any proposals and then you have to reissue again. And so what we did was instead of doing, going through that RFP process, we had a requirement stock. And what we did was we, we made a lot of phone calls and we said, hey, we're looking for, you know, we wanna do a Drupal build. Can you give us some recommendations? And we just made a ton of calls. I, I, you know, I talked to other consultants, I talked to other folks. And we then basically called all of the recommendations and said, here's what we're thinking, let me send you the requirements. We'd love to then have a conversation with you. And so that's what we did. And we ended up with three final interviews um, where we got proposals based upon those conversations. And then went through that three kind of typical RFP interview um, and then made the selection that way um, via stakeholder input and the typical process. But we didn't do the typical process for the RFP. And, and I will tell you, it worked well for us because we had the opportunity to really, and it's funny, we keep on talking about the relationship, but we had an opportunity to really talk with folks, have real conversations and have that back and forth. And even after that interview, we did a couple of follow-up um, interviews because this was a large six-figure project. We wanted to make sure that we had the right vendor for this project. And so I will say that if folks are really at a place where they're not quite sure, one, seek help from a consultant potentially to help you put together the RFP. It might be the best investment you make. Um, and two, unless you are, unless let's say, I'm gonna call out LSC here because LSC does require you to go through this particular RFP process. If, if you don't need to do that, think outside the box a little bit because you might actually get a more equitable process in that by doing that outreach, by picking up those phones um, and going through that process. And then, um, you know, in our scope of work, we always kind of put our general project management philosophy. And then again, I wanna emphasize documentation. Okay, um, I'm glad to take any questions. I see Simon's up, so I'm gonna turn it over to him. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, should we wait until the end for the questions or kind of take it each section at a time with questions? In case something's on yeah. people's minds. I'd say we take questions. We can take questions as we go and people can also put it into the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. I want it to be open so that people feel as if they can ask questions. I don't know, Bianca, if you had a question. Not at this time. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Simon. Okay. Um, so my name is uh, Simon Ra. Um, I've been uh, in the IT world, doing development or project management or leading uh, IT departments for the last 20 plus years. So my focus has always been on vendor selection in the IT world development, uh, web application development, uh, mobile app development, and so forth. So I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of a bent on that, coming from someone who's more technical. Um, I want to start off with just, just uh, reminding people what the general or common set of steps are. Uh, so my focus is primarily on the mechanics, the logistics of actually 
you know, putting out an RFP, doing a review, gathering feedback, and then doing interviews and so forth and selection. So I'm going to talk about the mechanics primarily. If you have any questions later on in terms of, you know, some of the uh, selection criteria, what what kind of uh, companies and so forth, and how to write up the RFPs and so forth, I could ask that separately uh, after the, the um, presentation, uh, and I could direct those specific questions. So in terms of the general process, um, you start off with, of course, sending out the RFP or RFP, uh, then you have a Q&A process. Typically, this is remote. Uh, people send in their email uh, questions, and then you kind of consolidate all the questions into a single document that has all the answers. And because many of the questions are very common across different vendors, you want to consolidate them into a single set of answers and then send it out to all the vendors who responded. So in fact, this is actually like the first round of uh, selection. People who ask questions are typically the ones that you will want to focus on when you actually receive the proposal later on. Then once you receive the proposal, you do a first round of selection. So assuming you have a good selection to choose from, let's say 10 or 20, uh, you usually want to pair that down to the finalists, like two to five finalists. Uh, and during that process, there, we have to put in some kind of objective uh, selection process. And that's where I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the selection tool that uh, we've been using. Once we have the finalists, then we, at that point, we tend to do the interviews. So we actually talk to them in detail and ask about the proposal and ask for clarifications or ask them, I know you said that you want to do this step, but can you do it some other way or can you skip that step or, and so forth. So you could actually adjust the proposal during the interview and ask um, you know, if they're willing to change the budget even. Uh, so that's a more, it's a pseudo negotiation during the interview. From the interview, then you could do the final selection. That's when you do another round of vendor selection. Prime, typically, it's essentially reviewing the same set of criteria and scores you gave in the first round, but just adjusting it based on the interview and how they, how the vendors came across when you talk to them and their flexibility. Flexibility is very important. So this uh, URL at the bottom is a Excel file, or sorry, it's a Google Sheet file. Uh, which anyone in this meeting ha have access to. So you could you know, go to it and then make a copy of it into your own Google Doc or download it as an Excel file and work on it. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, I could go through that, uh, this tool a little bit more detail later on if you're interested, but what it does is it essentially has a different tab for each of the vendors. And for each of the vendors, you have the criteria of scoring. So yeah, how, how they wrote up the summary, uh, what the company background is and so forth. And you can weigh each of them, depending on how important those are criteria are. And then for each of the reviewers, and assuming you might have like three, four or five reviewers, they, each of the reviewers would put in their own scores. And then the tool would automatically average them and they give you like one score for the vendor. And then the screen on the right, the screenshot on the right takes those single scores uh, and break, breaks down by the criteria and then kind of puts it onto one sheet. That way, when we when the uh, reviewers meet after this and discuss each of the vendors for the first round or the second round of selection, they could look at the scores and <clears> see what everyone else gave and then compare and contrast. And this is where the uh, qualitative discussion comes in as well. So even if the score for vendor one was you know five out of 10, but you really like them because you've been working with them for the last 10 years, that is a very strong reason to maybe choose vendor one, even though their score is lower. So although it is supposed to be primarily objective, uh, you need to provide room for subjective arguments. So this is a tool that you guys could look at uh, later on, uh, have access to, and you could download if you need to. So let's move on to the next. Uh, I just mentioned one thing since I, I have worked with Simon and I worked with Simon using this tool in the past. And one of the things that he sort of stresses is that thinking about so sort of that other, that like you determine what the criteria are, right? You determine and how much you want to weight each of the criteria. So it might be, for instance, locality might be very important. It might be important that the provider have relationships grounding in the community. So the, the fairness of it is that you're gonna be comparing based on the same criteria, but also remember that sort of that criteria is what you determine and you will come together and make that determination what those criteria are as, as part of your stakeholder group. And I found it very helpful exactly. in that way. Exactly. 
Uh, and the weighting, of course, is important because even though you're scoring on, let's say, budget, um, that may not be your most important criteria. So understanding the different weighting is important. So this, uh, so this slide kind of describes why we have this more structured, objective way of uh, reviewing. And why not just have people read the proposals and discuss during a meeting? Uh, this, by having these scores and weightings and criteria, um, it does make there are three things. One is that the, each of the vendors know exactly what to focus on when they put in their proposal, when they write their proposal. So they know they're going to be uh, rated on the writing of the proposal. They're going to be uh, graded on the history of the company, graded on the uh, how they write up the, uh, the project plan or project uh, approach. So they know where to focus their energy uh, if, if it's limited. So that's one. The other is that we also, of course, then uh, have to be as fair as possible to all the reviewers. So all the reviewers need to be given some direction on what to focus on. Um, because some may, uh, there might be individual preferences in terms of like, uh, write up of how how well the writing is done, you know, the prose, or how short the document is. They may have certain um, preferences in those areas, but they, if that's not part of the evaluation, then you know it doesn't really matter because we want to have the same criteria across all the, the reviewers and all the vendors. Uh, so having that kind of a clear criteria for evaluation is important, both of the uh, vendors and the reviewers. Secondly, uh, by structuring it this way. Uh, and putting, allowing people to, or requiring people to put in scores, at some number, uh, you could objectively average those numbers up appropriately. Uh, so even though, um, you know, maybe the overall score is five out of 10, um, you are very impressed with the price. So it's much lower than everyone else. So um, you might think that because the price is so low, we should go with this vendor one, but it forces people to look at all the criteria together rather than one specific impressive attribute of the vendor. So that's the second reason for having a numeric score so it's as objective as possible. Uh, and then lastly, as I mentioned in the previous slide, even with all this objective numbering and, and criteria, you still need to leave room for subjective discussion. So even with all the scoring and all the you know, very structured uh, criteria, uh, when we when you do meet among the reviewers for selecting the vendors, there's going to be people who make an argument for certain criteria that no one's ever thought of. Like maybe a uh, minority owned business is a very big thing that we didn't consider when we were writing the RFP or maybe uh, location or, or the fact that uh, a particular company worked on a very similar project very close by uh, that might be a criteria that you can put into the RFP, but that, that's something that you might want to bring up during this uh, interview or during this uh, uh, review meeting. So I think I have one more slide. The next, please. Yeah. So what are the different criteria? And Susan touched upon this as well. And it, it's very similar to what you put in the RFP are more or less the kind of, um, criteria that you're looking for when you're scoring them or reviewing them. Um, Believe it or not, proposal write-up is actually pretty important. Uh, it, it, it goes to whether the vendors are serious about the proposal. Because very often when you see a lot of proposals, you're gonna see they sound very boilerplate. So if you see a very pretty proposal that's like 30 pages, that doesn't mean they actually put a lot of effort into it. Uh, so the, the fact that they're following your instructions for how to write the proposal is actually a very good indicator of how serious they are about the project. Uh, secondly, of course, company background is important, uh, how they understand their scope of work. And this is something I, I saw also, many vendors, especially the larger ones, they'll literally copy and paste your scope of work paragraph into their proposal, which is for me a huge red flag. <laughs> that means that again, they didn't really think through what the work is about and they didn't re iterate or re rewrite the scope of work as they understood it, which is very important. And then of course, project plan is important because that means that they actually thought about if they had the job, how would they approach the project? So that's a very important uh, indicator of um, whether they're good project managers and they know how to organize projects. And then of course, budget is very important. And then there's always other, as I said, always take into consideration that there are other criteria that you're not thinking about that needs to take uh, serious uh, consideration. 
So for me personally, uh, I found that the company background in terms of what the work they did in the past and the examples of their work, as well as how they write the project plan are the two most important indicators of a successful vendor. Yeah, I was just gonna add like, I, I'm always a little wary when I see really slick proposals on a template that are, you know, the beautiful graphics and like tells a lot about their executive team, but tells me nothing about how they're gonna actually like build the technical functional yeah. requirements to get me to MVP. Those things are troubling to me. So, you know, everything Simon said, it sounds weird, but the slicker that template, the more wary I am, the more they emphasize who their executive team and less about what the work they're going to do tells me that they, they cobbled together, because they're always cobbling together tons of vendor proposals. Um, and so I will say those are kind of my red flags as well. And one thing that's, at least for me, I love it when a vendor contacts me and says, hey, I'm really looking at this. I have questions. And that to me, you know, and then to make sure that the RFP process is fair, if we know, we'll make sure to post those questions. But just, I like that when someone engages me and says, you know, I read this, I'm not sure if I quite understand. Um, and then just to make sure the process is fair and equitable, we'll go ahead and post those questions to everyone that has expressed an interest. Yeah. My one last recommendation uh, that, that I always tell everyone who's involved in the RFP process is that the proposal we receive is not the final proposal. Very often what they propose for the budget or how they're gonna do the project is not the final way we're gonna do it or find the budget. So uh, even if, uh, you know, let's say you had a budget of $50,000 for this project and someone came up with a $100,000 uh, proposal, that's fine. Uh, you could still select them and, and talk to them and say, you may be thinking of something much more sophisticated than what we're thinking. Can you do this for more like $40,000? $40, and then very often vendors will say, oh, okay, sure, no problem. So don't think that what, what's, what's sent in for the proposal is the final version that it's a yes or no kind of situation. It's more about a sense of their competence and their understanding of the project. That's, that's more important in a proposal. I just add one okay. caveat, which is have realistic budgets about what it costs to actually build something. That's, that's the only thing I would add. Yes, one of, one of the things that I noticed is budgets can be all over the place. I've received proposals where I did wonder, did the company truly understand what were the requirements? And sometimes I've noticed that those are companies that are younger, newer, that are BIPOC companies that are, and I've spoken to them and asked them, what do you understand this project to be? Do you want to talk about it a little bit further? Have you thought about budget range potentially? And maybe that's not the best interest of the organization, but I do want to be fair and I do want to be equitable. And if, if I'm willing to have those conversations, I think that can also help someone next time when they do their next proposal, just to think about, okay, maybe I should look at what's out there in the market. So budgets, I think, are a hot topic. We'll think we can talk more about it, about whether to put one in, whether not to put one in, and what does it mean when people um, go really off your budget? Because sometimes it might be that you actually didn't plan it accordingly, and you don't really know what the requirements are, and you are under really under the market. So thank you. So we just have two more slides. I just wanted to bring into some, some considerations about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and justice, equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. Just thinking about like, since we are most primarily, I assume, justice-oriented organizations, are we looking at vendors that are committed to justice and fairness? Are they committed to and aware of the cultures and identities in our communities? Like, do the vendors have connections to our communities and what can that mean? Sometimes that can be incredibly beneficial even for a project that could be a website rebuild. Like you're gonna need community input. So are these vendors gonna be able to get that community input? Do they have trusted partners or partnerships within those communities that you're serving so that they can also help you with potentially user testing, but there's so many different ways. So just trying to think as we're, we're thinking about justice in the work that we do, also thinking about in the, our engagements with partners and with um, consultants. 
And so here are just some things that um, I found online. Um, I think Susan mentioned earlier about sort of government agencies giving a lot of information about equity and inclusion. So just think about putting your mission, vision, and values in your RFP so people that are clear about it. And also then you can see if when people are responding to your RFP, do they use some of that language? Do they understand that language? Is it clear to them? Or does it seem as if they're, I don't want them to copy and paste, but I do want to see some mirroring of the language to understand where we're coming from. And then think about requesting information about their own plans for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging of how they're gonna staff the project, how are they gonna work on the project? And think about like, are, is your RFP, like, are you, is it excessive, unnecessary? Are you asking for things that truly aren't necessary for you to make a determination as to whether this is the right vendor for you or for your organization? Like, because sometimes it's, it can be unduly burdensome and that can sometimes have a negative impact on communities that are just starting out in this process. And I would just really stress performing outreach. As Susan mentioned at the beginning, it's not enough to just post on LSNTAP. It's not enough to post on Progressive Exchange. Like you need to really be reaching out to other networks, other communities. You need to reach out, reach out to the grassroots organizations to figure out who are the people that they're working with. Like the, the performing that outreach is a really important part, I think, of this process. And also then you're going to learn some more about this project that you're trying to engage in, and it will give you some new information. So that is what we have. And now we're open for questions. We want this to be more of a questions. We did want to lay sort of a, a groundwork for RFPs and vendor selections, but now it's open for you all. I mean, one first question that I just had is like, what are those red flags? And I think Susan, you mentioned one and Simon, you mentioned one. Like what are red flags that you've seen in proposals or moments where you've had um, a poor experience and you probably could have noticed if you hadn't checked for those red flags in the beginning? Not mentioning any names. Yeah, for me, um, the biggest one is when they understaff is when the proposal right. says we have one consultant working on this project and it's a it's a project that I know is going to need multiple consultants or if they're significantly under budget like they say 17,000 and you're like it's a whole rebuild of, of a platform those are red right. flags for me and we're going to figure out what to do yeah I'll second that also with the budget uh early on in, in my career uh we were so focused on the budget we said yeah here's our 30,000 budget so make sure our the proposals come somewhere near that and the ones that's closest is the one that we go with um, the problem is that uh, budgets in proposals uh, are, are variable as we said because it's a uh, project itself is very undefined very often when RFPs go out so when someone comes in with the half the budget that you expected or double the budget you expected it's not because uh, that's what the project requires it's because of the understanding of the project based on the information that was given. So don't rely too much on the budget. Uh, at the same time though, as Kiskeda mentioned, uh, do not go with the cheapest option because that is a huge red flag, uh, more than you know, too expensive budgets, in fact, because too cheap means that people are just trying to get their foot in the door and they'll do anything to just say yes and realize, and you end up with a project as a mess and get over the budget. Uh, the other one, um, has to do with when uh, the proposals seem overly accommodating. <laughs> so when they essentially regurgitate everything you're saying, say, oh yes, we will make sure we'll reach out to the community. We'll do the, everything that you put in your RFP that they just regurgitate just to make it as close to what you're saying. That is a red flag. That just means that they haven't really thought through if they were doing the project, how they would do it. That may not agree with you. So it's better to have a critical thinking kind of write-up rather than someone who's just too agreeable. I think Rochelle had something in the chat about where to, so since we're, um, since we use Drupal as our content management system, but then we build tools on Drupal, um, like my, and DrupalCon hasn't happened, I think, maybe it'll happen this year, but um, like, he'll attend that my product manager attends that um, we'll sometimes send out things through membership so that we can think through like outside of traditional I guess even commercial development shops in terms of Drupal so um, so I think folks can think outside of the nonprofit kind of channels 
and think through where um, like DrupalCon is one. There's they have memberships you can get member. There's different things, and and then there's different opportunities there as well. But um, obviously LSN tap and things like that. Sometimes you know folks can reach out to program officers at LSC just to get names. Obviously they can't make recommendations, but things like that, right? Um, and then just within. I know like um, obviously there's a group of statewide websites. And so, you know, maybe we will ask folks to send things out through those networks and things like that. So I, I think you just need to think through um, both on the nonprofit and on the commercial side. Yeah. Michelle, did you have your hand up? Yeah, just in, in follow-up to that. I mean, one thing that would I would find helpful is if there was some way to have a, a list of, of uh, you know, places that people have worked with that they would recommend or even proposals that they got. Sometimes you get more than one good proposal, but you go with someone else, but the proposal seemed likely. I mean, it would just be helpful to have some kind of centralized list somewhere. I don't know if LS and TAP could keep something like that or, um, um, you know, rather than have to go reach out individually to every single person, you know, in, this, in the country who's done an RFP recently. Yeah, believe it or not, um, I actually use Google. I look for, like, let's say, a technology consulting firm in a New York area. And of course, you know, get hundreds. But uh, just by doing Google, you, and there are, of course, lists of like you know, best performing, whatever. And I usually start with that. And of course, uh, I supplement that with any recommended organizations that uh, vendors I've worked with or uh, word of mouth kind of thing. But that works pretty well, just doing a simple search for a certain type of uh, consultant, uh, especially if you say, you know, technology consultant in nonprofit, technology used for this particular area, you could get a pretty good list that way. Um, because whether it's word of mouth, whether it's people you've worked with in the past, they're not necessarily the cream of the crop <laughs> that's out there already. Um, so yes, they may be more trustworthy because you've worked with them before, but there may be people out there that you've never talked to that no one around you knows could be very good. And you only know that when they send in a proposal. Mm -hmm. I've also noticed that there are consultant networks and I, especially in Massachusetts, there's some really great consultant networks and the social innovation forum, for instance, they have lists of diverse consultants that they work with. So it's tapping into those different networks in your state or if you want it or within your metropolitan area, can be really beneficial because I've met some really great consultants that way. And I think Mark, you had a comment flash question. Mark Lartson. Yeah, put it in the chat. I was I was just saying as a as a prospective vendor and some of these engagements, sometimes I get the impression that the the RFP has been written and it's really wired for a specific consultant and they and the company's just going through the motions because they have to have cover or they're required to, and you spend a lot of time responding and, the, and you don't get selected. Uh, is that an illusion? Does that actually happen from your experience? Your experience? Is that a common phenomenon or is that just the, a uh, paranoia on the part of responding uh, parties? I think it depends on what it is. There are some things that are so particular and that are specifically within one group's area of focus, like one consultant group area of focus, where there aren't that many, there's not that much competition for that type of work. So I've had times where I'm just like, there is no one else that actually can do this work. But when I've done website design projects, honestly, it's it's open to everyone because it, there's a very large community. So I, I don't think, that's not what my experience has been, but and I've been on both sides of the nonprofit and the and vendor side, but um, I don't know. So I, I will tell you that when we have a particular vendor in mind, we don't do the RFP. We, um, and sometimes that requires us to do a lot of paperwork, like for TIGS, for instance, right? Where we know we're gonna do a sole source contract, but we don't think it's fair to other vendors when we know that um, we're gonna use a particular vendor for, for reasons. Obviously, LSC wants us to go through all the reasons, but we'll, we'll do that. And if I issue an RFP, it's an open selection. But I'm not saying that, that is what always happens. So Mark, I think what you're suggesting potentially probably does happen because 
I agree. Sometimes there's something that's so niche that um, you may have to, because your funder is requesting that you go through these hoops and there's no other way to do it, um, that basically you have to go through those hoops. And so, um, and I think someone else put in the chat that um, some vendors don't even respond to RFPs because of that process. Yeah. Yeah, I would second that. Actually, it is more prevalent. I mean, Mark, you're not imagining things. There are there are times when RFPs do go out and it definitely looks like it's catered for one specific vendor. Uh, and that does happen. And, and primarily it's because the funder requires that you do the selection, uh, the vendor selection. Uh, and the best way to you know, identify those is if the uh, the RFP mentions specific products and specific ways of doing the project that's requirement, then you know they have someone in mind. Uh, if it's more open-ended and say, you know, I want to create a website that does this for the community, more general like that, that means that it's a fair selection process. I just ask the audience, are you having any challenges or any things, I, don't, I didn't see any hands up, but any things that you want to bring up, challenges that you've seen as you've tried to develop RFPs or as you've tried to engage in the selection process? Actually, related to that, uh, there was a question that amongst us, Kiske and Susan, we, we talked about, it's like, what if you are not technically, technically minded mm. and you were given the project to doing some technical, you know, IT, project, how do you write an RFP that's, you know, informative? Uh, has anyone had an issue with that? And, or how, how do you deal with something like that when you're, you don't have the technical knowledge to you know, put together a good functional requirement or even know what the criteria should be for choosing an IT consulting firm? Don't say copy another RFP because those requirements may not be right for you. Yeah, um, because I know that sometimes the suggestion um, and I think I went through our scenario, which is we actually hired a consultant to help us. They, they're not, they weren't a vendor that we would, they had the technical consulting know how to help us put together the words in a way that we get responses and folks would know what we were talking about. So we actually ended up hiring a consultant to help us. But I realized not everyone has the budget to do that, but that's what we ended up doing. The other possibility is to get a skills-based volunteer. So we have LexisNexis on our board and obviously they build um, and they help us uh, because they have skills-based pro bono volunteers. Um, and, so, and so that's a possibility. If you have that kind of shop that's willing to do that and work with you folks, um, that is a possibility. Like, uh, and that could be a way to get some um, no cost, essentially, assistance in building out requirements of folks who have to do this every single day so that you can say the right things so that folks actually understand what you're trying to build. Then it also improves the quality of the proposals because what I found is when I didn't quite understand the technical requirements, I got the wrong proposals and they did not meet the needs and I had to start over. <laughs> That's not a good use of time. I see that someone says, has anyone built that kind of technical consulting cost into TIG budget? I wonder, has anyone framed it as a, like a business process improvement or analysis? That might be a way. Uh, has anyone um, built the, that kind of technical consulting into their budget? Yeah, the way that I've done it is through uh, BPA and BPI and then through there, I was able to get the information requirements and recommendations that I could then build out the proposal. Um, Jamie Levine? Yes. Uh, Susan, who did you hire and how did you hire that person and how far did that consultant take you? So we hired um, the Ripples Group out of, um, out of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and they helped us, they do, they do MVP consulting for large commercial and they work with multinationals. They also work with nonprofits. It's part of Attila, who's the founder. It's um, his, it's kind of his uh, ripples, right? So he, 
he was part of very large corporations and consulting. Like he worked for Bain, he worked for a lot of different large Boston multinationals. And then um, he and his wife now though, also have a nonprofit practice and we connected with them and they helped us. They also helped us with the landscaping. They work with a lot of data providers like Ipsos and everything. And so they helped us pull together that information as well. And they did it at a reduced nonprofit price for us. And I'm guessing it worked out well for you? It worked out well for us, yes. Um, because I think one, we had to do the landscaping regardless because it was part of the community led design, right? And we needed uh, a consultant to do that. So um, we did issue an RFP for this, but we wanted someone with that technical expertise that had done IT, like large software or product builds that could help us think through how to place those requirements in language that we could then build out an RFP. And so we just happened to um, be able to marry those two with one consultant. And then John Grayson didn't help us with the technical aspects of it, but he helped us in terms of that community connections. And so those were the two consultants that um, we actually had multiple proposals, proposals from both of those folks. And I asked those folks to work together and they agreed to do it. Oh, okay. So I also negotiate contracts. I was, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so, um, and I basically asked them to do it and they agreed to do it and to bring their unique skill sets to the table. Oh, thank you. Um, and I, I don't think you should uh, uh, underestimate the power of RFIs as well. Uh, especially if you don't have anyone to like reach out to help or you don't have the money for it. If you just find the vendors near you, as I said, so do a Google search and then send an email to each of them saying, you know, we're thinking about starting this project. We're not sure how it should be done or what the cost should be. Could you, you know, just recommend what tools to use or what technology to use or what cost you think it will be? Uh, many of the vendors will reply back because they're interested in projects like that. So they'll say, oh, this sounds like a $50,000 thing and you could do it in WordPress and it shouldn't take you more than three months. People respond very quickly like that. Now, that's not enough to like fully flesh out an RFP, but at least you get a sense of you know, what vendors are expecting for a project. Like that. So that would give you a very good head start, especially with the terminology that they use. If they say this is a document management system or a reporting system or a content management system, you know to put those kind of words or phrases in, in the RFP because that's what the vendors understand. Great, thanks. Mark? Yeah, I was just gonna say that my colleagues and I often find ourselves in this role of being a consultant to the process where we're helping an organization uh, send out and deal with uh, RFPs. And uh, one of the biggest issues we run into is the, the, the use of the vocabulary. We talk about requirements and very often requirements are not true requirements. There are must haves, there are must not haves, and there are nice to haves, right? And especially if you've got a team of people who've never been through an RFP process before, they get them very confused. Uh, your, your, your tool, Simon, I think is a very well, very good way to deal with that, to clarify what's, what do we actually care about and how much when we weight it. But I find that just a, just a common issue is just the, the vocabulary people use when they talk about vendor selection. Any other questions or recommendations? Thank you, Danielle, for uh, your comment in there. I understand that. She just said, I just went through this and had to have many conversations with developers, do a bunch of research and talk with folks within our community who have more tech expertise than I do. It was a learning process. And I wish we could have hired a consultant to help determine what the best options are for our particular project given new technologies available. Yes, I hear that. <laughs> That's what I was suggesting, potentially a uh, business process analysis or business process improvement, because you can sometimes get funding to do that. And it could be a small project, it could be a larger project, but it can really help you think through, okay, here's the process that we're engaged in, here's what it could look like, here are recommendations for the future, and here's what you need. So, but I know it is hard to get funding for this. Uh, I have a quick question, I guess, for everyone. Uh, what is the average time span of, well, first writing the RFP, 
and then going through the selection process. Are we talking about four or five months worth or can this be done in one, one month? I don't think a month. Who's done it in a month? Does anyone want to put their hands up? <laughs> like <this is> <laughs> Okay. But it is an involved process. So I guess mm -hmm. people should be aware that you do have to commit to a lot of hours going through the process. And hopefully have staff internally who can work with you to do this. Maybe you could let them have a slightly lower caseload or something or give them some kind of ability to be able to work on this project engage in, in technical work within your organization. It's a plug I always make, sir. It took our team many months to get an RFIA. It's hard. The problem is the longer it takes, the more things shift. Sometimes you just have to get it out the door before everything changes again. Yeah, and sometimes if you do it in a month and then you start to realize, oh, okay, actually I need to adjust this and I need to reissue it because this is not what I was looking for. I don't want to keep people just to keep people, but if people have any other questions, concerns, ideas, I think we went through red flags. We looked at some questions about differences. We can talk about, uh, we look at common mistakes sometimes people make in the selection process. But if people have any other like final um, observations or questions, please speak now or we will end. Um, can I ask one more question? <laughs> Are there any resources that people know of, like a list for you know RFP templates or a list of good vendors or any kind of resource that people can follow up on? I found some good information on government websites, RFP, RFI, samples. It's like plug and play. And, and I haven't actually used them, but when I was, when we were going to do this panel, I started to notice them and just think, okay, this is really interesting and helpful. So yeah, when I, I was, just, yeah, I was going to, oh, go ahead. Yep. So just to follow up, I think it would be great if, you know, we could, LSN tab could help build out some of the, I think they're already starting to have a section on the website for RFPs, but it would it would be really great to encourage people to send their RFPs or, I mean, many of the RFPs do end up on the LSNTAP email list. And I know I have like searched that list to try to get um, RFP samples before, but also related to that, I guess, you know, what I said before about companies that people would recommend and also um, costs, I, I would find all those things really helpful. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm um, kind of following up a little bit on the government. Um, when I was with the state of Ohio, because the rubric is so specific um, and because of the sunshine nature of an RFP or an RFQ or an RFI process at the state level, those rubrics and the templates are very like step one, step two, step three. I haven't looked at my um, state of Ohio ones in a while, but I know like when I used to do RFQs for experts um, as part of our litigation unit within the AG's office, like it was very specific, like what we had to um, put in um, because those went out as part of Sunshine. And so I do think those are good resources and I could try to see if I can find some and then um, kind of to Rochelle's point, I think everyone's asking for kind of a central repository of information, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, everyone.